and I was so happy, you know. Oh. I didn't need your husband. You are the one that I wanted. Well, Ziggy, I'll tell him you miss him very much, and he sends his regards as well, obviously. Mm -hmm. Manfred and Siggy, hello. Hello, hello. Very nice to see you again. Sorry. Uh, what, what a privilege for us. Thank you, Your Highness. Thank you. I think it was 2017 we met each other for the first time, wasn't it? It's lovely to see you again. You may remember Siggy and I met in 1944 in the camps. I and do. then by chance we met again later on and we are friends to this day. Oh. I, I must tell you in all honesty, when I uh, arrived in this country, in 1946, I did not dream that in my lifetime I would ever have the privilege of seeing, never mind connecting with royalty. Uh, it confirms to me that I will never appreciate fully how lucky I was to be admitted to live my life in this country in freedom. My, my life really began when I arrived here until I was 16 years old, I didn't know the meaning of life. But I was nine years old, well, three years when the Nazis came to power, nine years old when the war broke out, and 11 when I was sent to the camps. And of course, all Jewish schools were closed in 1939, so I'd had no education for seven years. And here I was yesterday, looking at this wonderful photograph Yes, I remember. <laughs> does, it bring, does it bring back memories to you? Absolutely. It feels like yes. it was yesterday, Manfred. It doesn't feel like it was so that long ago. Yes, yes, indeed. The Nazis insisted that my father left Germany within 24 hours of obtaining that visa. And two weeks later, the war began. And that meant my father spent the war years in England. Mm -hmm. And we, the mother with two children, was trapped in Germany. So we didn't see my father. He didn't know the fate of his family throughout the war for, for six long years. Post-war, with the help of a British welfare officer, um, a search was begun and it took three months or so before we made contact with my father. And he, of course, applied for permission for us to come and join him. And that is how I came to the UK. After that, um, Manfred, would you, were you all able to be together again uh, as a family? Yes, we lived, we lived as a family. Unfortunately, it was a bittersweet reunion because my younger brother was murdered in the camps. And mm -hmm. so instead of having four of us in the family, there were just three. And how old was he, Manfred? He was seven years old when he was taken into the camp and nine years old when he was taken away to be murdered. He's just so young and this is the horror. Yes, I, I was then 13 and I was already going out to work each day. Um, that, that is what saved my life. I was always fairly strong for my age. We were facing a selection which meant shuffling single file forward until we, each one of us faced an SS man who would say left or right. And by that time we knew that Left meant death today, right meant survive until the next selection at least. I was sent towards those spared. My mother was sent to those uh, to be murdered. And she resourcefully managed. It was miraculous. Both, as I shuffled forward, the man behind me whispered to me, if he asks you your age, say you're 17. In fact, I had just passed my 14th birthday. But as he had primed me, he did ask me that question, and I said 17. I pondered on it, but I'll never know whether if you that had man him. saved my life. I never mm -hmm. saw him again. Yes. He was behind me. I don't know which way he was sent. I, 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 he's in my thoughts mm -hmm. as my, my angel who, who primed me. I don't think I would have had the resource myself to say 17. But possibly that helped save my life. And did you find out afterwards why 17 was, was the age? Um, yes, apparently, I, I've been told since that people thought um, once you were 17, um, they began to value you as a potential 
slave laborer. I think one of the main reasons they allowed us to live was to exploit us as slave labor. And as long as you had strength yeah. to perform a solid day's work, which was expected on a starvation diet, of course, um, you had a reasonable chance of surviving at least to the next day. It, it, it was a, a daily lottery to survive. And, and Manfred, what, um, what long-term impact has it had on families like yourselves, the, the horrors that you witnessed and experienced? Well, I know that many survivors have not had a peaceful night's sleep. Many, even to this day, that they invariably have nightmares. I was really lucky. I was probably one in, in a million, perhaps, who had both parents alive after the war. Mm. All my friends, including my friend Ziggy, um, they, they, none of them had two parents alive. I had a home life. Of course, in 1940, every Jew had to be in a certain place, which was the ghetto. And in the ghetto, I was working there for four years. If you couldn't work, you were useless, you didn't get any food. But I was working, you know, and working till about 1944. In 1944, they said, we've got to get rid of everybody because the Russians are very near. Could I, if I want to, I can go with the metal factory where I work to Germany. So after a few days, we came to the station and I said to my grandmother, I can't see any trains. She said, they're standing in front of you. I said, that's not for us, that's for animals, not for me. Anyway, they opened those doors, they get it in and they started putting people in. There was no way you could sit down. If you sat down, they sat on top of you. So I didn't know, so I was praying. Maybe I was so bad I was that I said to myself, I hope somebody will die, I'll have where to sit down. And next morning, you know, every morning they used to take out the dead bodies. So eventually I had where to sit down. And you know, and I can get rid of it, you know, up till today, how could I think a thing like that, that to see somebody dying? So I had where to sit down. That's what they made me do. You know, eventually we arrived one early morning, they opened the door and we didn't know where we were. And somebody said, oh, it's Auschwitz, which is Auschwitz. I didn't have a clue what Auschwitz was. They told us to leave everything there and will they take us to washing and cleaning? Well, it happened that other people that went with the group they had to go for a selection. And 90% of them were killed straight away. And there were women with children and they were holding the baby. And the German officers came over and they said, put the baby down, go to the other side. They wouldn't do it. Eventually they shot the baby and sometimes the woman as well. Us, we left, we didn't know what's going to happen. Us, they took us to the place. We washed, we everything. We didn't get a number on our arms, but I had a number here, 84,303. And I always beg up till today, how can I forget that number? Mm. And I can't forget it. I want to get rid of it. Eventually, some officers came and they told us, we looked for you and we, we need 20 boys to go to a camp, a working camp. 
And this was the camp that Manfred was. It was a very small camp. And we went, wait there. I was three months in hospital. Then I went to another place. Then I went to a place, I think Manfred was as well with me, that I got little pictures of it, where we were. And I got a letter from England. I said, who's writing to me from England? I opened the letter, it's written in Polish by a woman. She said she used to live in Poland at a certain place where her son used to live. And I said to my friends, my mother found me and she wants me to come, but I don't want to come. So then the people that were looked after us, the British, the Americans, and also Jewish Brigade, they had went mad with me. You found somebody, look around, they've got nobody. And you got a mother? Anyway, I decided to, it took about 10 months to come. I came to England. The first six months were hell. I had everything I wanted. But I did not have my friends like Manfred. They were my friends. After the six months, my life changed and I had the most wonderful, wonderful life. I would never go anywhere to live. Good. Well, I'm glad you stayed here, Ziggy. And it's Fantastically, you made new friends and a new life mm -hmm. here. And am I right in, in thinking that you met your wife here in the UK? Yes, we got married, we had a life, and today I've got two daughters, six grandchildren, and five great grandchildren. What a life I had. The story, stories that you both have shared with me again today and your dedication in educating the next generation, the younger generation, um, about your experiences and, and horrors um, of the Holocaust. It shows extreme strength and, um, and such bravery in doing so. And it's so important and so inspirational. So thank you so much for once again, sharing your stories with me and for all the work that you do um, in, in sharing your experiences. <music>
incredible. We all have a role to play. All generations have a role to play um, in making sure that uh, the stories like we've heard from Ziggy and Manfred today um, sort of live on and ensure that, you know, the lessons that we've learned um, are not repeated in, in history and, and, and for, for future generations too. Um, so it's amazing the work you're doing. It takes um, extra effort, I, I know, but I'm really glad that there are the young generation flying the flag um, for this really important work. So, so well done. My audience more frequently than not is actually Maxwell's age. I speak to six formers quite frequently. And what I end up telling them is that please remember that all it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to remain silent. And I, I do get feedback which indicates this has been taken aboard. I'll just read you one which I have in front of me because I thought you, you might ask me about feedback. So I prepared myself by selecting a few. This one says, I want you to know that your words about never ignoring injustice are highly relevant today. And I assure you, I have taken them into my heart. Showing that these words of yours do have an impact. Well, and for most of these youngsters, it is a once in a lifetime experience to listen to a story by a survivor in the first person. I've been told time and again that learning about the Holocaust from a textbook is rather dull and doesn't really make much of an impact. But to listen to a survivor um, makes an in incredible impact. I've had quite a number of responses saying, I will never forget your talk. I'm writing it all down to pass it on to my children in due course, as this atrocity must never ever be forgotten. Manfred, you know, and Ziggy, I, I never forgot the first time that we met in 2017 and your story has, your stories have stuck with me since then. And it's been a pleasure to see you again today. And you're right, Manfred, it's so important that um, these stories are passed on to the next generation. Thank um, you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. I assure you we, we have not forgotten our meeting either. Mm -hmm. Highlight of our lives. Thank you.